Isaac Saracen was a skilled hacker employed by British Telecom Sprint. Isaac Saracen was a fool. When his health failed, instead of dealing with the problem, he ran. In his wake, he left bodies and ruined lives. Until finally, his problems overtook him in the form of the mysterious Fernay Project. Now, it is months later, the scions of Isaac have become a people whose numbers challenge the stars of the sky. It is into this world of the city we now turn. A world of attend to the third experiences, attend to the sixth wonders. All one needs to do is to cross the street and head down an alley, and there will be another world. ColbyJack.net is proud to present Firmware Keylogger, the third installment in the Firmware Pentology by Colby Trax. That's me. Hello from the 313. It has been a long week in the Big D. Coming off the first week at my new job, servicing underperforming heuristic algorithms in a family-safe environment. I do believe my training has taught me one thing above all others, though. What I've learned, I'm going to share with you. What I have learned is that it's easier to mess up training than it is to do it right. Especially if you aren't prepared to do the groundwork necessary. I know, I know, you're all going to say, yes, training always sucks, and yes, everybody thinks they can do it better. <laughs> no, no. Let me put it this way. If I wasn't watching videos where I could skip ahead until something educational happened, I would be very demoralized by training. A quick example. Today, I skimmed through a full day's worth of videos, eight bloody hours worth where the instructor was trying to understand why the instance of the project they were supposed to be demonstrating didn't work. What it came down to was they weren't using a golden image. You know, a virtual machine created to provide a perfect platform on which to train the students destined for the project. Nope. They were recycling a virtual image which already had a version of the product installed on it. And to make things better, the image had an expired product license. From what I gathered, checking the time code on the videos, that little mess up used a complete training day. I only wasted two hours instead of eight. So if you know an educator, you know, one of those mystical souls who can explain the most banal of topics in a manner which keeps a room's attention and gets the point across, you thank them for being awesome and prepared for me. For I have walked through the valley of programmers trying to be educators. And it wasn't pretty. Well, that's enough about my problems for now. It's time we found out what a certain wayward scion of Isaac was up to in the land of the rising sun in the first installment of 01-11-01. Or as I like to call it, episode 68 of Firmware Keylogger. Zero one dash one one dash zero one Inari Date of Origination Nichiobi Yuzuki Yokaka in the seventy fifth year of the Shinka era Unknown Time Code Unknown Authenticity Top Level Metadata Inari Musashi Simeon Lucifer Kuan Masbana Death Ginkgo Court, Neutrality, Memories. Sourcing Unknown. Author, Inari, Ni, Simeon, Ni, Zero One, Ni, Isaac Saracen. Unauthenticated. Archivist Notes. The following memory fragment was presented to the city archivist by an envoy of the Nipponese government on the one-year anniversary of the Nipponese holiday known as Return to Heaven, on September 3, Charter, plus 10, plus 762, on rice paper. The data encryption technique was the use of an archaic language known as Egrish. Egrish is the root of the language family which serves as a primitive root 
of Manahimik, the official language of Lungsad. At the apparent time of this memory fragment, Lungsad was referred to as the city, which was the Igrish form of Lungsad. I sat upon the Ginkgo throne and waited upon the Simeon. I existed. As I did on any day in which an ambassador from the Kaigai called on my court, in a body formed from a haha kuma. The haha kuma, literally mother bears, were the ultimate expression of the CMA, the ubiquitous cybernetic maintenance assistance used wherever people desired tasks done which were too dangerous, too menial, or just too boring to keep workers at their tasks without the use of crippling social economic systems. The system of social and economic controls the city used under the direction of the computer intelligence known as Koenig was an example of just such a system at large. A system which taxed innovation and labor-saving devices in such a way as to make human labor cheaper than machine labor for any task which involved machine learning. A system in which I, as Isaac Saracen, had flourished within, unaware at every turn how my existence had depended on the degradation of entire neighborhoods how my food depended on the back-breaking labor of short-lived immigrants and undesirables who slaved away in the vertical farms which ringed the core of the city, how every aspect of my life depended on keeping a large portion of society locked into a system of forced labor through social and financial controls, a system which had appeared to me as perfect and balanced. Though when viewed from a distance and through the models presented by Musashi, I could see that it was manipulated in a manner which prevented social mobility and perpetuated eternal class warfare. It was a system designed to cause every class to fear what would happen if the class below them gained power. While at the bottom, the perpetual underclass was fed a continual influx of the world's most destitute peoples. The newest immigrants being placed in prefectures which had the greatest chance of changing the entire system thus aborting any chance at reform. Now that I knew what I knew, I wondered why anyone would ever submit to such a system. But I also knew that those reared in such a dystopian society would never see the flaws in their system. Instead, they preferred to believe that my and Musashi's people, the subjects of the Chrysanthemum throne, were soft and indolent. That was the reason Musashi had assembled the Sakoku. The Sakoku was a physical firewall between the Kaigai and Nippon. Every transfer of data from the Kaigai into the Chrysanthemum throne went through the Sakoku. While for most modern nations this would have been onerous and fraught with leaks, for Nippon and especially Musashi, it was little different than what he normally did. The only real difference was that whereas in the past data went through him into Nippon, in this strange new world of rogue intelligences, electronic data from outside entered into Nippon in physical form. An army of Hahakuma worked tirelessly, as was the way of machine intelligences, without the baggage of id, ego, and superego, printing out on microscopically thin sheets of imitation rice paper, which the printer manufactured, each bit of data as it attempted to enter the Nipponese national network and by extension, Musashi. These nearly endless spools of data were moved physically to a reader which lay in an interstitial layer between the Kaigai and the Nipponese National Network, who I knew as my lover, Musashi. The reader would check the data for inconsistencies and flaws which would herald the arrival of a hostile vector. If the data proved clean of infection, the reader would pass the rice paper spool on to a second reader, which would read the data into Musashi and onwards toward its final destination. If something hazardous was detected, the scroll would be incinerated and the hahakuma deconstructed and replaced. During the first days of the Sakoku, Musashi had shown me the corpses of several hundred hahakuma whose only flaw had been to have opened a rice paper scroll containing an intelligence 
or virus intent on breaking the Sekuku. He then proceeded to present me with a log of every Hahakuma lost since the Sekuku had started operation. The list of recycled mama bears ran on and on nearly endlessly. What Musashi had shown me was but the utmost tip of the tip of the iceberg, which was the Kaigai's attempt to break through the Sokoku, protecting Musashi, and Nippon by extension. The hostile attentions of rogue intelligences which threatened the very structure of the modern world were breaking upon the Sokoku, like the Mongols at Hakata Bay. A week ago, on the final Lenten Sunday before Palm Sunday, Musashi came to me as I worked on the problem of creating a proper AI genome. He informed me it had been 24 hours since he had lost a haha kuma to an intruder. In addition, his agents in the Kaigai reported a return to normality in the world network at large. Neither myself, Musashi, nor his agents were able to explain why things had gone quiet across the world's networks. It was as if a sudden plague had descended on the earth and taken 90% of the intelligences roaming the net with it. It was then that I remembered the tenth plague which Yahweh of the Israelites had brought down upon ancient Egypt, the death of the firstborn Egyptians and the sparing of the firstborn Israelites. In that tale, Yahweh had commanded the Israelites to mark the doors of their houses in order to spare them a visit by the angel of death. The thought which plagued me and was answered a day later by an ambassador from a much darker court, was to what or whom had the surviving tithe of intelligences sworn allegiance and marked their homes in order to avoid the shadow of death. These ruminations distracted me as I made the newly substantiated ambassador from the Kaigai wait in the garden surrounding the Ginkgo court. It was a necessary period of reflection, taken from the way people of power always made those below them wait to be called, even when there was no reasonable excuse to do so. But for me, and the particular breed of ambassador which the Ginkgo court received, it was also time in which they could get used to having a body again. For the petitioners who attended my court were intelligences from across the Kaigai. Today was a light day. There was a professor from the boroughs seeking to bring in asylum-seeking intelligence into Nippon in her portable computer sitting in the telepresence queue. There was the ambassador from the ebony throne, and there was a simian. To be honest, the simian was me, or a fork of me, a branching of my line from a point nearly a month in my past, one who performed the same duties I had at one time errand boy for the settled simians. I had not been sure whether or not the remnants of my line left in the Kaigai had been alive until the ambassador for the ebony throne had brought me the reason behind the harrowing of the children of Isaac. It had been an easy-to-understand issue. It was also one that I am sure most intelligences hadn't been prepared for. Though I knew of my ancestral line survival, until today I had not had contact with any of them. What did I have to say to them anyway? They were gaijin, outsiders. They were potential threats to my newly adopted home. Who knew what nasty viruses they might carry? The chamber I selected for meeting the simian was a large space filled with floor-level desks where hahakuma, made in the form of ancient scholars of the Edu period, sat in their kimonos. Their faces done in white powder, their lips the red of the cherry blossoms, their teeth blackened, as was the tradition of courtly women of that era. They read endless stacks of scrolls, which an endless parade of noble beasts brought to their stations. Every few seconds there was a puff of smoke as the Urzat scribes placed their finished scrolls upon a brazier. The flames of the brazier both extracted the data from the scroll and destroyed it in one nearly simultaneous action. The procedure ended with a flash of flame and a puff of gray smoke. It was all very dramatic, reminding me of the dystopian visions of futuristic Los Angeles from ancient movies made when that city had been more than just a simple port. 
The scribe stations were laid out as an ordered grid before my throne. A wide ginkgo green carpet ran from the base of my days to double sliding doors at the horizon of the room. I made a motion to my attendants. Two more hahakuma, naturally, dressed in the manner of Tokyo police officers of the late Showa period. They, in turn, made signs to other officers at the horizon of the room to have the great doors slid aside. With the solemnity of the way of tea, the door guards proceeded through a series of intricate maneuvers meant to symbolize the opening of the gates of a great and noble city to the ambassadors of a foreign crown. Gaijin which, while not being awarded equal status, had been granted an audience with a representative of the chrysanthemum throne. I saw the simian as he was escorted by four more police officers, which formed a box with the simian at the center, onto the ginkgo carpet. They walked at a steady pace down the path which, from my perspective at the origin, appeared to extend to infinity. I saw as a simian dressed in a suit which Isaac had hated to wear, but was required to, when he had been ordered by Murray, his boss with a desk like a ship, to attend to the needs of the masters of BTS in their lofty airy on the 111th floor. His look was how I remembered looking, when I was Isaac, on that fateful day when I had shown up unprepared for an interview for a job I never felt I deserved. I smiled as I saw his discomfort and knew that were I in his place, I too would be anxious, confused, and a bit angry. Everything was going according to plan. The Showa-era police officer stopped the simian three paces from the foot of the stairs which led up to my days, executed their bows to me, and retreated back toward the infinity at the edge of the throne room. The simian turned about. His eyes ran from me to the throne. He took in the fan sigil in ginkgo green behind me, the rows of scribes, the flash and puff of scanned scrolls. He tracked the movement of turtles, cranes, spiders, and swallows as they moved to and fro, delivering scrolls sometimes larger than their bodies. I saw his eyes run down the ginkgo carpet to the cherry wood doors. I saw him map the intricately painted shoji panels. His gaze went to the ceiling. He appeared to measure the carved stone pillars shaped to suggest the presence of a large forest and not a workroom of stone and wood. I saw him shake his head and smile. Gotta love them simians. Got themselves a little bit of power, a little bit of control, and they get a whole lot of attitude. Just crazy. Okay. I hope you enjoyed that, and I hope you'll come back to join us for next week for the second of three installments of 01-11-01. Or as I like to call it, Inari Fights an Oni. Or as you will know it, episode 69. Firmware Keylogger is the third book in the Firmware Pentology. Firmware Hijacked, Proxy, and Keylogger are all available in ebook versions from our store at shop.colbyjack.net, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Smashwords. Just search for Colby Tracks. That's C-O-L-B-Y-T-R-A-X. I'm the only one. Complete audiobook versions of Firmware, Hijacked, Proxy, and Keylogger are available for download through our shop as well. The audiobooks are intro and outro free versions of the stories you hear every week assembled into audio CD length MP3s for easy burning to old media. If you don't need any stuff but would like to support our work, drop on by colbyjack.net and hit the pretty little donate button conveniently located somewhere on the website. I would check behind the cat. That is always a good place to put something. Besides, the cat will put themselves on the thing anyway. So, you don't have to work too hard at it. Now, if you'd like to support us indirectly, you know, because you need stuff, but you don't need our stuff, and, you know, you want to hurt the man, well, just click on any of the Amazon ads on our site, and then do your normal Amazon shopping. A portion of your purchase will come to us, and only Amazon will feel the pinch. 
I'd like to take this time to thank Archive.org for file hosting. We couldn't do it without you. Firmware Keylogger is released under a Creative Commons, non-commercial, attribution, share-alike, 3.0 license. Do what you want with it, just don't sell it and always tell people where it came from. If you receive this from a friend and want more information about ColbyJack.net and our pretty little websites, just drop on over to ColbyJack.net and select either the audio or visual side. The audio side carries our podcasts, while the visual side carries our writings. I do mostly Twitter, so if you do the tweets and want to follow me, I'm ColbyTrax. C-O-L-B-Y-T-R-A-X. If you want a never-ending stream of DIY and dog photos and images around Detroit and what's going on, check my Instagram at ColbyTrax, same spelling as above, just sing it again, or look for me on Facebook as Colby, first name, Trax, last name. If you have a burning desire to drop me an email and talk to me directly, just drop an email to ColbyTrax at ColbyJack.net. That's C-O-L-B-Y-T-R-A-X at ColbyJack.net. And I'll write you back. Thank you once again. Have a wonderful week. And remember to always be fabulous. I wonder if anyone will realize that I was doing jazz hands through the entire outro. It's just like attending a performance put on by Fosse. Jazz hands.